Okay, going from that topic to charitable legacy planning. So this is something that is near and dear to my heart. I'm Anna LeBlanc with the Catholic Foundation, my colleague Michael George. And uh, we're going to talk to you about some different choices that you have when you're looking at your own um, legacy in the, in the terms of, of finances and how you want to be remembered um, with your, your children, um, organizations that are close to you. And um, we at the Catholic Foundation promote compassionate charitable giving and stewardship that serves our donors and the needs of the community. We work with individuals um, and their giving as well as organizations who have endowments with us. So why do people start thinking about these, um, these types of, of conversations? Maybe it's that you have a, I talked to somebody earlier today, they have two, two children graduating from you know, high school, college, those grandchildren, they're moving on. Um, maybe your kids are doing, doing well, they don't need as much financial assistance as maybe you thought, maybe they're doing better than you are, you know. Um, so birth of grandchildren. Maybe you've gone through a, a death of a loved one. Um, I know I've, both my parents are gone now, and so just going through the whole process of burying a loved one, going through their estate, if you were the executor, you know how important it is to do that planning and, and making some preparations ahead of time. Or if, you know, just thinking about, you know, how you want to be remembered and what do you want to do with the, with the hard-earned money that you have. So what is a planned gift? When we say planned gift, what do we mean by planning a gift? And for me and a lot of people, it's not just, you know, someone gives you a request for a donation and you just go online and do a credit card gift or put cash in the, in the plate um, at at uh, the collection time, but you really have to stop and think, okay, I want to do something significant, I want to do a gift, what would that look like? And we're really talking about gift from your assets, not how much is in your checkbook, but okay, if I want to do a significant gift, whether it's the church has a building campaign or you want to do a scholarship at your high school or your college or something significant like that, it's going to take some planning and some thought. Um, you know, you have to think, okay, well, this is how much the church needs, or this is how much the school needs, and, you know, could I do that? Could I do that over a specific time period? Could I do it during my lifetime? Could I do it maybe after my lifetime? So just different things to think about. And it's probably going to involve talking to your CPA, talking to your estate planning professional. So just keep that in mind as you're, as you're thinking about what you would want to do. And so why would somebody want to be philanthropic in this way? And it's really, you know, you, if you've had organizations that are close to you, you know, maybe they've kind of changed over your lifetime. Maybe when you were younger, you know, you had certain interests. And as you grow older, and, and maybe the, there's different organizations that are close to you. Maybe it used to be your parish, you know, when you were younger. Maybe, maybe you've changed parishes. Just, you know, as you go through thinking about what are those organizations that are close to you. And really being able to direct your giving. And, you know, if you want to give to a certain area, you know, it's your money, you have those choices. And, it's, and I always like to say that, you know, it's better to, for you to make that decision versus let, letting the government decide where your money is going to go or maybe even your children saying, well, I think they were interested in this, but you're the one that knows what you're interested in. So do you have anything to add there? Good. Okay, so where would you, where can you give if you're, if you're charitably minded and, you're, and you want to give? You know, we talked about charity. That's just any basic 501c3 organization that's probably, you're already on their mailing list. So um, you know what those charities are. Or if you decide, if you've been maybe talking to some friends or you know people or it sounds great, oh, I'm going to start my own private foundation. You know, that's, um, that's great if you can do that, but it's really for people that have those seven-figure assets, you know, really like five million up is really the, the, probably the range where you would start your own private foundation because there is a lot of legal ramifications that come with that and, you know, paperwork and not saying that it's bad, but, you know, private foundations, like Michael likes to say, private foundations are not private. So um, when you give, you have to do, you know, public, um, public tax returns and that tells the world, you know, who's, who's on your board how much do you give per year, and so it's not a private foundation, but 
if you did want to do something that you know, had your name on it like that, you could do that. There's a third option that, that we do very well at the Catholic Foundation, and, is, and that's just basically establishing a fund with a foundation, a community foundation. So we're, we're a community foundation. There's the Dallas Foundation. There's the Communities Foundation of Texas. There's, you know, in every large city probably has multiple community foundations. And so we'll talk more about what that means, establishing a fund, but it's basically like a charitable checking account where you make a gift and then we're, we're the ones that help distribute that out for you. So when you, when you think about making a donation, making a gift, making a planned gift, you know, what does that look like and where would that come from? And, you know, as I said, it's not necessarily those, those check, that checkbook giving, but we, we and many organizations accept all of the, the resources listed, listed on the screen. So say you have um, some stock that is appreciated in value and you want to donate that stock. So don't sell it first and then donate it. You want to donate the stock to the organization so that um, better for you tax-wise and um, hopefully that organization can accept it. Some organizations are really small and they can't accept those, those types of gifts like stocks and retirement plans and things like that. So that's when you would use a community foundation to help you. So, they, so you would donate the stock to the community foundation. They can turn it into a check and make sure that that um, smaller nonprofit gets it. So that's one way to use a community foundation. So with the stock, basically, say you pay $10,000 for that stock, and it's appreciated in value, now it's worth 15. So you transfer the stock to the charity. The charity is gonna give you a tax deduction for the 15, it only costs you 10. So that's one way to think about that. For retirement plans, that's one where um, people that are now 70 and a half and older and, and even older, older ages for that, that's one where if you do have a retirement plan and you want to use that as a resource to, um, to make a gift to charity, um, you would tell your retirement plan holder, send that check directly to the charity instead of sending it to me and then I write a check to charity. So that way um, you don't have to take the uh, recognize the income of that, of that um, distribution coming to you, and then the organization can get it. Maybe you have an insurance policy that's paid up, a paid-up paid policy, or you want to start uh, a new policy. Maybe, maybe you're willing to take out a policy so that you can make that bigger gift to that organization. So that's another, um, another way to give. Um, some organizations, I know we do, we will take uh, real estate and homes. Maybe you have a second home. Maybe there's a ranch in the family that nobody wants to inherit. Um, so just thinking about what do, what do you have to your um, availability to give. Oil and gas is another one. Um, some people have those royalties, and they're, they're a great income for an organization. So that's another um, possibility to give. And even artwork and collections. Um, I've seen cases where people have donated Steinway pianos and different artwork or, or some kind of special collections that you have that, that it's either the organization will be able to use it for their, for their um, charitable purposes or they're going to turn it around and sell it and turn it into a scholarship or something like that. So that's just another thing to consider. I don't know if I could just jump in for just a moment. Something that's really, really important to understand about all these assets. Take a look at the middle of the board, you know, in terms of retirement assets, whether they're IRAs or 401ks or insurance policies. The thing that makes them different than every other asset on the board is the fact that they don't pass through your will, okay? They pass by beneficiary designation. So when everybody had their IRA and when they were starting it, they made you fill out who that beneficiary was going to be, right? Whether it was going to be your spouse or your children, what have you. It will not pass by your will. Your will, if you, you could put it in there, but the thing is, is that it will be disregarded. They will go by the beneficiary designation that is on the form that you filled out when you opened up the IRA. Same thing with a life insurance policy. And one of the things that makes an IRA especially a very, very, good candidate for a charitable gift is the fact that the IRS 
eliminated the stretch IRA. So what's a stretch IRA? It means that when you die, let's say you're giving it to your kids, it used to be before 2017 that you could pass it on to your kids and your kids could take the IRA out over their lifetime, right? Not anymore. After 2017, it's a 10-year period of time. So basically, it's a maximum tax plan. Uh, they have to distribute out the proceeds from the IRA within 10 years, and they're going to pay tax on that. The great thing about utilizing an IRA as a charitable gift, however, is that the Catholic Foundation or any other charity does not pay tax on that. So you get the full bang for your buck, the full value of the IRA you are able to utilize by, by uh, giving that to charity as opposed to your kids. All things being equal, the rule of thumb pretty much is pre-tax assets like retirement plans and insurance policies, great candidates for charitable gifts. Everything else that gets a step up in basis through your will, give to your kids. Okay? Thanks. Yes? Okay, you can, you can actually give from your IRA at any time. Uh, you know, starting at 59 and a half, you don't have to pay that 10% penalty for early withdrawal. 70 and a half, and it's probably beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today, but there's something available called a qualified charitable distribution. Has anybody heard of that? There you go. Okay, great. Uh, 70 and a half, you can, you can do that. But let's say you're 69 years old and you want to make a gift from your IRA to charity, you can do it. There's nothing that prohibits you from doing that. No, it's not. Seventy and a half. Right. So, yes, sir. If you make a contribution while you're living, you can get a tax deduction. How about if you say when you die and then the money goes to a charity, you get a reduction in your taxable State value. Uh, the question was, if you give from an IRA, from an IRA or just in general? Both. Okay, thanks. Uh, any gift that comes from your estate or an IRA, okay, it reduces the size of your estate. So uh, the size of a taxable estate for a single individual now is plus minus what's the number? Twelve. Twelve is between twelve and thirteen million dollars. So I don't know about you, but I don't have 12 or $13 million. And for a married couple, double that, right? So it's somewhere between 24 and $25 million. So, but it will, yes, a charitable gift upon death from your estate or by beneficiary designation will reduce the size of your estate and thus your tax liability if you have a taxable estate. Okay? All right. So there's... Um Charities love gifts anytime. So whether you give it now, during your lifetime, or later, they will surely accept it. So um, we're all familiar with cash gifts, uh, stock gifts we talked about a little bit. Um, let me explain donor advised funds if you don't know what those are. Um, you, you've seen them everywhere, you know, whether it's through Fidelity or through a, a community foundation like the Catholic Foundation. But basically it's a, what I call a charitable checking account. So um, for us, basically you put in a minimum of $10,000 the year that you do this. And so I, I have one, I know Michael has one um, with the Catholic Foundation. So, so I use it to give um, to, for my church, uh, for their you know, weekly collection. I give it for the Bishop's Annual Appeal. I give to my university, to my kids' band. I mean, there's, you can just give it to wherever you want to give it. So basically you put in this $10,000 you get a tax deduction that year, and then you can decide you want to give all that 10000 back out into the community, like I described, or maybe you want to do it over two years or over three years, or you don't have to spend it all out the, the year that you do it. Um, and then you just add to it. Say, okay, you want to put 10000 in one year, maybe you spend out eight, and then you're left with two at the end of the year. Maybe the next year you want to put in five or 10 or 30, you know, whatever whatever it makes sense for you. And so at the Catholic Foundation, we have a, a donor portal where you just go online and say, okay, I want to give this much to this organization. We mail out those checks for you. And you get one tax receipt from us. And 
That's a great. So we can, we can talk more about that if you have questions on that. We talked about the IRA um, qualified charitable distribution. Individuals can give up to $100,000 a year from that, um, from that IRA to a charity. So know that. And it doesn't have to be just one charity. It can be several different charities. Yes. Thank you. On the donor advised funds, could you comment about the income that's earned on the monies that you put in the donor advised funds? I believe it's all going to be tax deferred as long as you spend it on, on charities. So with the, with the donor advised fund, at least I can only answer for the, the, quali the policy that the Catholic Foundation. So we have market participating and non-market participating. So if, if it's a non-market participating fund, um, there's no fees to use the fund from the Catholic Foundation. And so um, what happens is whatever, you know, the earnings on that, we grant those out into the community. So you, you might have seen um, articles and pictures that, uh, from um, grant ceremonies that we've had um, in the Texas Catholic. And so we give grants out to churches and schools. And so that's where those funds are coming from to, you know, fix the HVAC and things like that. So, and then there's the market participating funds, and those we do charge uh, 1% on those, and then um, the earnings are gonna be up and down depending on the market. But, but that, does that answer your question? And these earnings go to the charity. Right, I, I think where your question might be headed, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, is, okay, let's say that you have $10,000 in your donor advised fund, and it's participating in the market, meaning the value can rise or fall based on the performance of the underlying assets. Uh, does that constitute a taxable event for you? It does not. You got your charitable deduction at the time that you established the fund, and any rise or fall in the value does not affect your tax situation at all after that initial gift. Okay, great. So now we're talking about later giving. Um, you know, some people, the, you know, you might want to give during your lifetime for several reasons. Don't you want to know where your money's going and, and see the organizations that are benefiting or meet those students or see that church being built? I mean, some people want that feeling to know, you know, exactly how that's being used. Other people are like, that's okay. I don't want to have to, you know, I don't want to think about it now. I don't want it affecting my, my lifestyle and my income, so I'm just going to have it be deferred. And whatever's left at the end, the church can go enjoy that or whatever organization. So talk about a will. Um, Michael Kennecke is going to talk about wills and after our session. You may want to establish an endowment. You may want to say, you know what, I've been giving 5000 a year to All Saints for the last 30 years. And when, I, when I'm gone, I don't want that $5,000 to stop coming to the church. So may, you may want to make an, endow an endowment so that... You know, it's a hundred thousand dollar endowment, and then the the church or that organization could get that five thousand dollars a year in perpetuity. So that'd be great. And then um, we talk about beneficiary designations. This is just another way to um, support a charity. Um, it doesn't have to pass through a will, but you know, if there's if there's a form that has a beneficiary designation form, you can name an organization. You know, whether that's your your life insurance, your bank account your retirement account we talked about. So that's just another easy way for, for things to pass to the next generation. Um, we talk about um, giving now and giving later and giving twice. And so there's, there's um, several things that you could do uh, with charity that's gonna support the charity plus, um, plus your family or, or for you. And so one is a charitable gift annuity and that's where you make a donation in year one, you get a tax deduction that year, and then we, or the organization that you do this with, is going to make payments to you for the rest of your life. So I'm just gonna fast forward to this little example here. Hopefully you can read that. So this is one where the older you are, the better rate that you get of the payment that you get. So for us at the Catholic Foundation, it's a minimum of $10,000 to establish one of these charitable gift annuities. And you have to be at least 50, and you could do this for one life or for two lives. So if, if it's um, husband and wife, and you know, one, is, one is 75, one is 80, you know, we would take that into consideration on the ages. 
So for the, in this example, if you're 70 years old, you put this $10,000 into the charitable gift annuity. So that's on the, the Catholic Foundation to pay you an annual payment of 5.9% uh, or four, $590 per year for the rest of your life. And the year that you make that $10,000 donation, you're not going to get a tax deduction for the full $10,000 because some of that is coming back to you. So what we're doing is... Um, the tax deduction of 4215 is what we are evaluating as that's how much is probably going to come back to that charity. So that's how that works. So we'll take a couple questions maybe later on that one. Um, so going back to um, this other, other option is the charitable remainder trust. And this is another, another vehicle that you could use where you put funds in to a trust during your lifetime, and whether it's for 20 years or, or a lifetime, depending on, on how that works out, you're going to get those payments for the rest of your life. Say, say you establish this with $100,000, and the next 20 years, you're probably going to get that $100,000 back from the interest that's earned. And then at the end, that, that charity that you name is going to get an additional $100,000. So it's really a great way to um, utilize um, all of the, the earnings from the, the, the returns from the, the investment, basically, is what I'm saying. So whether you can do it where charity benefits at the end, or you could do it charity benefits now. Maybe you want to do something where charity is going to benefit for the next 20 years, and you really don't want your kids or your grandkids inheriting that when they're younger. Give them a chance to get a little bit older and then they would inherit that, those funds. All right. Okay, and uh, you know, it's great to talk about the split interest scripts. One other thing I wanted to mention, remember we were talking earlier about IRAs that they get taxed to your kids? Not only that, but there's that 10 year window where they have to take the distributions. Well, utilizing a charitable remainder trust, which was on the previous slide, Remember, charitable remainder trust, charitable remainder. So if you gave your IRA, for example, you wanted to benefit your kids during their lifetime, you could gift your IRA after death to a charitable remainder trust, and for the rest of your kids' lives, the money comes out as a stream of payments to them. It's, it's the way to mimic a stretch IRA, okay? so. IRS says you can't do it anymore, but if you put it into a charitable remainder trust, after you're gone, you can stretch those payments out over your kids' lifetimes, and then only after your kids are gone would the monies go to charity. So that is one thing that you can do with a charitable remainder trust. So the last thing in terms of a, what's called a now and later plan is Anna was talking earlier about utilizing a donor-advised fund kind of like your own little private foundation without all, without all the red tape during your lifetime, right? So you're giving to those causes that are important to you during your life. You can amend your donor advised fund or put some provisions in there that upon your death, second to die, it turns into a permanent endowment. And then you have a gift coming from your estate or by beneficiary designation for the purpose of that endowment. And it would go to support the charitable causes you know, that, are, that are important to you. It can go to support your parish, it can go to support Catholic charities, uh, it can go to non-Catholic causes. You're not limited either in a donor advised fund or a permanent endowment to simply Catholic causes. It can support all of your philanthropy as long as it's not in conflict with Catholic teaching. Very, very important point. So what's great about this is it simplifies your will. Because instead of laundry listing all the things that you want to give to in your will, you know, what you do is you just say in your will, I want X percentage of my estate or the residue of my estate to go to this permanent endowment at this community foundation, whether it's the Catholic Foundation or anybody else. And you never have to go back and touch your will again, okay, unless you want to change the proportion. Now, if you want to change the charitable beneficiaries, well, what you do is you change it in the fund agreement that you have with the Catholic Foundation. And for us, it's changing out an exhibit page in a fund agreement. We have you sign it, and we go about our business. Um, 
a lawyer, sorry, Mike, but a lawyer is going to charge you by the hour to change your will. You know, so the less you have to change your will, the more cost efficient it is for you. And we don't charge to change exhibit pages in a fund agreement. So it's a very tax efficient way to support the causes that are important to you. And it's also very fee efficient. So, um, and we pretty much covered this. You know, the great thing about, uh, about having a donor advice fund that per turns into a permanent endowment is it's easy. I mean, it's just drop dead simple. Um, and it's very flexible, and the great thing is, is you can change your mind over the course of your life. Um, you know, it's something where we have had people who have changed their mind three and four times. And the thing is, is, let's face it, as we get older, our charitable interests change sometimes, right? So you want your charitable interest to be reflective of your will, what your desire is to have happen. So we want you to maintain that flexibility, and you can with this type of an arrangement. So we've talked a lot about the nuts and bolts of all this, but what we want to do right now is to tell a couple of stories about people who have utilized a community foundation, in this case, the Catholic Foundation, to support their charitable giving. And the first one is a wonderful, wonderful lady named Rita Smith. And you know, one of the things I really like about Rita is she was about this tall. You know, she made me feel like Michael Jordan, not Michael George. <laughs> so uh, I could post up on Rita for sure. But, uh, but Rita was just one of the kindest people you would ever meet. She lived in Wiley, Texas. As a matter of fact, her house was right across the street from St. Anthony in Wiley. And when she passed away, she gave the house to the church, which was just a wonderful gift. But before all that happened, you know, she was involved civically as well as in the Catholic community. So what did she do? During her lifetime, she established a donor-advised fund to help with her charitable giving during her lifetime. She gave to the Wiley Public Library. She gave to the school system, in addition to Ursuline Academy, St. Anthony, all the different causes that were important to her. So what happened when she died? Well, when she died, she had assets in the fund, but she added to it from her estate. Okay, she put more in there, and she specified that the money was to go to specific named organizations. It was to go to the school that bared her name in Wiley, Texas. It was to go to the Methodist church. Her husband was a Methodist. She was Catholic. But, you know, Methodism is not in conflict with Catholic teaching, so they were able to make that gift. Also, St. Anthony's and Ursuline. So it was a very, very flexible interest, or, uh, very, very flexible arrangement that allowed her to continue her passions now and forever. She's a part of these organizations today. They receive contributions from Rita and Truett Smith in their name every year. So they aren't remembered just once when they died and you know, they left a big gift to Ursuline or, or what have you. They're remembered every year. And for, for a lot of families, that legacy to the charitable causes that are important to them is critical. So, you know, we do like to try to help people maintain those relationships. So, a question, remember we were talking with Chris Taylor earlier and he was saying, talk about prices. You, know, you always want to know how much you know, you're going to pay for different things. Well, you know, it works in terms of charitable giving too. People want to know, well, how much is appropriate really for me to give for my estate? And I'm here to tell you, it's a trick question. If you've seen, if you've seen how one person you know, handles it, you've seen how one person handles it. But there are a couple of things that we present to folks just in terms of ideas about what's appropriate. And only you can determine what's appropriate. But some of the things that people think of, first of all, is we've all heard of a bi biblical tithe, correct? And that's just 10% of your estate. And people would peel that off and give that first, first fruits. So that's something that's fairly well known. Um, another one, we're going to skip, we're not going to spend much time on this, but if you think about the things that you give to right now that are really mission critical, think about those and get an idea of the number in your head. If you wanted to endow that and make sure that those same gifts go out year after year after year after you're gone, well, just multiply that number by 20. So let's say that you give away $10,000 a year to All Saints, you know, to the endowment trust here at All Saints, 
to uh, Catholic Charities, to your university, to Methodist Hospital, wherever it happens to be. So if you give $10,000, well, what size endowment would support that level of giving? Well, at a 5% spending policy, you'd need $200,000 to do that. So that's where that math comes in. And I promised Tom Tilton that this would not be math intensive today, but that, that's, the, that's the highest math that we're going to do. So, but the thing, attaboy. So, but one of the things that really seemed to resonate with a lot of people is the idea of treating charity as another child. And it's, it's kind of a natural thing to think about because if you are giving a gift to charity, in a very real sense, you are treating charity just like you're treating your children, right? So what this means in terms of treating charity as another child is let's say you have three children at home. Instead of dividing your estate, and we're all fair-minded, right? My parents divided by six for the six kids and, you know, over and done. Uh, so most people divide their estate equally. It just works out that way. But instead of dividing by three for your three children, you divide by four. And that way, an equal share goes to charity at the same time. That's something that really has resonated with people and they really liked. So we just wanted to spend a moment and talk about how much to give, but you're gonna decide on your own what's appropriate. So, and then the last thing that we wanna leave you with is, so we talked about charitable remainder trusts. I wanna show you what the outside envelope of this looks like. Now, I want you to know that she did this in the 90s, or early 90s, and the return profile and you know stock market returns were way different. You know, nobody knows what the future holds, so these numbers, your, your experience might be better, your experience might be worse. But just wanted to show you the power of charitable, and, of charitable remainder trusts and what that can mean to your future giving. So Louise was just like, uh, just like Rita Smith, she was an Ursuline graduate. So my wife was an Ursuline graduate as well. Anna was an Ursuline graduate, so they're all over the place. Um, but she was Ursuline class of 35, and again, just like uh, Rita, she was a civic volunteer and also passionate about her Catholic Church of St. Bernard's, you know, over in Lake Highlands area. Single, no children. So she, she didn't have a husband, she never married. But she established a trust in 1992 of uh, almost $800,000, $777,000 of stock and property. So eight years later, Louise sadly passed away, but as part of her charitable remainder trust, she was receiving income, okay, from 1992 to 2000, and she received over $360,000 from that charitable trust during her lifetime. So that's during her lifetime. Well, what happened after she was gone? Well, at death, what was remaining in the trust, she used to establish a permanent endowment, okay? And the assets in that endowment were worth $4.5 million. Remember I said the 90s were, you know, kind of crazy in terms of, uh, in terms of stock market performance. Well, $4.5 million was what the trust was worth when she passed away. Well, since then, that trust, that permanent endowment, has given over $2.5 million, $2.5 million to charity. And the fund has also grown where today it's worth uh, about $9.5 million. Stock market has been kind of crazy over the last year, so this number might be, you know, a little dated. But what I want you to get the idea of more than anything else is the power of endowment, you know, the power of philanthropy utilizing these types of tools. And again, it's not just the purview of the Catholic Foundation, a community foundation, uh, you know, as, as Anna listed them, but also right here at the, uh, at the church, um, your finance council, the pastor, has established an endowment trust here. It's not just our purview. You actually have a planned giving vehicle right here at, uh, at All Saints that helps support the church, not just now, but way into the future. And, you know, I just like, uh, you know, for Mike Holmes, who is on the finance council. Mike, would you raise your hand or stand up, please? And then also Rusty Miller. Uh, both of them are members of the Finance Council, and they have, were very, very involved in terms of the establishment of that trust that is going to benefit All Saints, this community, not just now, but for a long time to come. So how many All Saints parishioners do we have here? Awesome. Well, 
I dare say that none of us, you know, when we die, we want all saints, you know, it did its thing for us, we want all saints to dry up and blow away. We want it to be here for our children and our children's children. Well, these gentlemen have helped to make sure that that happens. So just wanted to, you know, tell you a little bit about all saints and what they've done in terms of, you know, plan giving themselves. So uh, in conclusion, what, okay, what do we do now? So we have all this great information, and how is this actionable for us? Well, the first thing that we'd like to encourage you to do is to pray. And just to think about what's important to you, your family, how am I going to be remembered? You know, do I want to support charity after I'm gone? If so, how much and how do I want to do it? So then after praying about it and discerning a little bit, then take stock of all the gifts that God has given you. Remember, all, those, all the things that we have, it's all rental property. You know, we don't get to keep it. We don't get to take it with us to heaven. It stays here. So take a look at it, you know, and plan in terms of what you want to do for the benefit of your kids, what you want to do, you know, for the benefit of the charities that are important to you, and how much you really want to give to Uncle Sam. Because when you die, there are only three places your money can go, right? It can go to your heirs, it can go to charity, or it can go to taxes. And you get to pick two out of the three. So, and that's where having CPAs, estate planning professionals like Mike Kennecke come in, and also from a charitable standpoint, you know, we can be part of your philanthropic team, uh, you know, to help make sure that your will is done. So having said all this, does anybody have any questions for Anna and I? Clear as mud, right? Yes, sir. Hang on, wait for a microphone to come around to you if you would. Over the years, I have read where your heirs are going to spend all the money you give them in 18 months. <laughs> Giving some of that to Catholic Charities, uh, or the Catholic Foundation may have a longer lasting legacy. Come on. Yay, I like that. <laughs> We did not pay him to say that. I, I can't ask for a better plug than that. <laughs> Thank you. One more. I, Hold on. Well, it's, it's for the tape. Oh, okay. What is the difference between doing an endowment versus doing an outright gift on death? Well, the outright gift basically... Um, Either way, the, the organization can, you know, when they, get the, when they get it, they're going to be able to spend it. You know, so if it's the outright gift, you're going to give it that year, they're going to spend it to whatever you specify. So if you give to an endowment, it just means that whatever that endowment is going to earn, you know, that four, four and a half, five percent is going to come to that organization every year. One of the... It depends on which organization you ask. A lot of organizations, they want money today. They want to be able to spend it today. Others are thinking into the future and do want to build up their endowment. So we would say it would be an endowment, but it depends on what organization. And I don't think this is too terribly pejorative, but, okay, if, if an organization, if an individual or an organization, to this gentleman's point, if they get a lump sum gift, if they didn't have something to spend it on before they got it, they got something after. You know, so, so the thing is, is that money t has a tendency to burn a hole in our pockets and we feel like we got to spend it right away, right? So the thing is, is that endowments were meant to be life-giving over time. It's meant to sustain an organization and to be there now and forever. It's, it's not meant to be this, this largesse, you know, that, you know, oh gosh, I've got to figure out how to spend it now. So, you know, you are really providing for an organization. And, and one of the things that's really interesting is, okay, let's say just for the sake of argument that you give $5,000 to All Saints, you know, every year. Well, what happens when you die if you didn't leave a gift for them in your will? Well, All Saints, in order to be made whole, has to get $5,000 from somebody else, right? I mean, it's zero-sum math. So by providing for that $5,000 in an endowment year after year after year, you know, you're keeping them whole even after you're gone. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hold on. Wait for the microphone if you would, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Richard. Yes. We'll, we'll get to you next. If you establish a charitable remainder trust, 
let's say of a million dollars, it's going to throw off 4.9% to the recipient. Okay, you're the talking about a charitable gift. Well, yeah, okay, right, yes, right. either way. For what period of time? Okay, for a charitable gift annuity, it's for the rest of your life. Um, for the rest of their life. Right. If you live to be 140, it's a contractual obligation between you and the charity who issues the charitable gift annuity. So it will go on as long as you're alive, it will continue. As long as you're breathing, man. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, let's have the microphone come to you, if I may. Thank you, Darina. The rates that you're paying are probably related to uh, the current inflationary rates. Is that fair? You're, they're going I'm sorry, up. can you speak a little louder, please? I said that the uh, rates that are being paid now are probably governed to a certain extent by the uh, rate of inflation, and I would imagine they're increasing now. Is that a fair comment? Um, the rates that I posted are from the American Council on Gift Annuities, and they they meet, is, is that what you're talking about for the gift annuities? Yeah, in other words, just the concept, uh, when interest rates are going up, I would imagine that you'll be able to uh, offer the uh, donee or the donor a higher rate. Is that fair? With the, with the charitable gift annuities, whatever year that you give, you're locked into that rate. So it'll be the, the same rate for the rest of your life. Oh, yeah, but I'm just okay. saying, but right now is right. the trend Right, the up rates are going, going up, yes. Okay, so if you can pick the top, then you'd be okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. wait, wait till your birthday, and then yeah. you okay. get a call year. Two, two things. You know, let me know. Okay. Let me know if you have that particular skill, and then let me know if you adopt, if you do. Yeah, it's something where just, you know, just something real quick in terms of when charitable gift annuity rates change. Every year, the American Council on Gift Annuities meets in April, and they discuss rate changes. And the rates change as of July 1st. And again, to this gentleman's point, you know, with the interest rate environment going up, you know, uh, don't hold me to it, but I'd be willing to bet that marginally the rates for charitable gift annuities are going to go up starting July 1st. Not a ton, not a lot, but they'll probably go up a little bit. So, do you have a question? Uh, I don't know if you have this, but what percentage of the overall totality of incoming gifts to the foundation per year is di directed or consumed by administrative expenses? That's a great question because we just had a board meeting. <laughs> so, and, and all these numbers were available. Um, so a, a lot of charities, you know, what they do is they'll, they will utilize, or you hear the number 10% thrown around a lot, that, you know, once you start to get over 10% in terms of administrative expenses, you know, that maybe that's too much money and under 10 is a good use of money. Our number, man, I want to say it was like 1.7%. Is that the number? So 1.7% of total assets under management go to expenses. And the biggest fee that we have for any of the, whether it's a donor advised fund, permanent endowment, whatever, the big, biggest fee we have is 1%. So we like to feel that it's pretty good use of money. I mean, when, okay, if, if the biggest fee that we have is 1%, that means that 99% of what you put in is going to the charitable causes that are important to you. We feel like that's pretty good. Any other questions? Yes, Lydia. Um, so if you have a um, endowment that is giving out money after you pass, mm -hmm. and say 10 years down the road, one of the charities that you're donating to no longer exists, what happens in that case? So within all of the, our fund agreements, we have a successor organization. So for instance, if you, if you gave to, you know, all Saints Catholic School, and maybe that the school doesn't exist anymore, then it would be a, a similar organization of Catholic education, K through eight or whatever you would name as a successor organization. Right. Does that help? And, and um, we're gonna go to break in just a moment, but just to opine for a second in terms of how very real that possibility is, 
Anybody want to take a guess in terms of how many charities there are in the United States? Anybody? 1.4 million. 1.4 million charities, which means, if you do the math, how many people are there in the United States and how does that go into 1.4 million? It's basically 225. So for every 225 people, basically double the size of this room, there's a charity in the United States. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, you know, it's cyclical. You know, there's an expansion of charities, there's a contraction. So the opportunity for a smaller charity, especially to go out of business, very real, which is why it's so important that we plan for that as part of our documentation. So with that having been said, we're going to take a brief break, another 10 minutes. Let's come back at 5 after 1, and we're going to have Mike Kennecke talk to you about the wonders of legal considerations in estate planning. Thanks.